This is an exploration of the 50 primary universal laws. The universe is perfectly balanced by natural and moral laws which are regulatory vibrations to maintain order. When you work within the laws, you can be assured of eventual positive outcome. When the laws are transgressed, you can be assured of suffering the only purpose of which is to teach a better way. Number one, the law of harmony. This law supersedes even the fundamental law of karma, for harmony is a supreme potential of balance. The purpose of karma is to attain harmony. If you throw a rock into a pond, you disturb the harmony of the pond. You were the cause, and the effect is the splash and the ripples that flow out and back until the harmony is restored. Now similarly, your disharmonious karmic actions flow out into the universe and back upon you, lifetime after lifetime, until eventually your own harmony is restored. So as you experience your life, you and the entire universe are experiencing the karmic ripples which will eventually result in harmony. Once you have evolved to the position of living an entire lifetime in harmony, you are free from the wheel of reincarnation. Number two, the law of reincarnation and karma. Until you have resolved your karma, and fulfilled your dharma, you will continue to reincarnate into sequential lifetimes upon the earth. Neither God nor the lords of karma bestow suffering upon you during these lives. You alone decide what you most need to learn in your earthly sojourns. And for each life experience you seek out other souls, often with shared histories, and always with karmic configurations matching your needs. Now whenever you act with intention, you create karma. Actions are considered to be thoughts, emotions, words, and deeds, and the motive, intent, and desire behind each. Disharmonious acts must be balanced in the future in this life or in a future lifetime. They are rooted in fear-based emotions, which must be resolved before you can release yourself from the wheel of reincarnation. You return, lifetime after lifetime, to test yourself, to see if you have learned your lessons. Now until you can go through an entire lifetime with total involvement and no disharmonious attachment whatsoever, you will continue to reincarnate. In other words, when you can live a life of perfect harmony, liberation will follow. Number three, the law of wisdom. Wisdom erases karma. If you have the wisdom to learn your lessons through love and wisdom, you can mitigate your suffering. Sadly, though, we seem to learn fastest through pain to directly experiencing the consequences of our actions. As an example, you greedily take from others, and instead of learning through wisdom and love that this is wrong, you have to directly experience someone greedily taking from you, whether later in this life or in a future lifetime. As another way to look at the law of wisdom, when you move toward a predestined test in your life, if you have the wisdom to proceed with harmony, you will surely mitigate the traumatic impact of the event. All right, now here are some examples. Example number one. In your last life you were married to a soul who is your mate today and whom you cruelly left for another in that previous lifetime. Before you were born into your current life, you agreed to be left by your mate under similar circumstances. Now this will allow you to balance your karma and directly experience the pain of abandonment. If, if, through the wisdom of Master of Life Awareness, it is easier to consciously detach from the relationship with love, 
you will ease the pain of parting while also passing your own test. Example number two. Assume that you have astrologically destined a severe relationship test for May of your 35th year. Now, if you have learned through past life awareness as well as present life learning to be positive, non-judgmental, and without expectations in your relationship, you may only experience an argument with your mate on that fateful day in May. But if you haven't learned your past lessons and have intensified the disharmony during your relationship, you might experience a divorce in May of your 35th year. Example number three. In several past lives you were so proud that you were unwilling to accept any assistance from others. Now pride is fear. So in this life you have astrologically predestined an event which will cause you to be institutionalized for many years. On a soul level you've decided you needed to create circumstances which would force you to subdue your pride and allow others to give to you. But through wisdom in this life you have overridden your pride and opened your heart, gladly accepting assistance from others. Because of this, you will not have to be institutionalized to learn your lesson. Wisdom will have erased the karma. Number four, the law of grace. Karma can be experienced to the letter of the law or in mercy and grace. In other words, if you give love, mercy, and grace to others, you will receive the same in return. All right, now here are a couple of examples. Example one. You have destined a future event in which you will be the victim of slander and gossip, which will ruin your career. But in the years preceding this event, you have become so kind and loving to other human beings, it is obvious to your higher self that you have learned your needed lesson. So, the predestined event will be mitigated having little or no effect upon you. Example number two. In a previous lifetime you were a person of great wealth, which you used selfishly for your own and your family's indulgence. In this life, you have destined yourself to experience monetary need. But you were so giving with the little you have you release yourself from this self-imposed bondage and once again rise monetarily, always sharing what you have with those in need. Number five, the law of soul evolution. Everyone on earth shares the goal of soul evolution, whether they realize it or not. We have reincarnated because we desire to spiritually evolve by rising above our fear-based emotions and learning to express unconditional love. In so doing, we raise our vibrational rate and move closer to a state of harmony. Even when it appears that you are not evolving, you are in reality making progress. We learn through the pain of our disharmonious acts which can be viewed as our mistakes or failures. But if you fell off a bicycle nine times before you learned to ride it on the tenth attempt, you needed nine failures to achieve your final success. In reality, every failure was a small success, bringing you closer to accomplishing your goal. Number six, the law of the bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is a Sanskrit term commonly accepted by most metaphysical adepts today. It means one who has transcended the need of earthly incarnations, but who has chosen to return to the earth to support others in achieving enlightenment. A bodhisattva knows he will never really be free until all souls are free. Most serious students of metaphysics have entered the bodhisattva development stage of their evolution. Number seven, the law of vibrational attainment. The entire universe operates on the same principle of vibrational energy. When Einstein discovered 
that matter is energy, he opened the door to merging science and metaphysics. The scientists have proven that energy cannot die. It can only transform. And, by its very nature, energy must move forward or backward, stand still, for to do so is stagnation, resulting in transformation. Now you are energy. Your skin, which appears solid, is actually trillions of swiftly moving molecules orbiting each other at a specific vibrational rate, a physical life rate that you earned in the past as a result of how harmoniously or disharmoniously you've lived your past lives and your current life up until this very moment in time. Number 8. The Law of Free Will The law of free will operates in three ways. Number 1. Although many of the major events in your life are astrologically predestined, you always have free will to mitigate the impact of the event or to transcend it entirely. This will result from how you live your life up to the situation you have destined for yourself to experience. If you give grace and mercy to others, are positive, loving, and compassionate, and demonstrate by your actions that you've learned past lessons, you can minimize disharmonious experiences. Number two, as you obtain Master of Life awareness and develop conscious detachment, you will be far less affected by worldly events than in the past. A Master of Life enjoys all the warmth and joy that life has to offer, but detaches from the negativity by allowing it to flow through him without affecting him. Number three, you always have free will in how you respond to any situation. If you respond with positive emotions, compassion, and integrity, you have probably learned your karmic lessons and will not have to experience a similar situation in the future. Number 9. The Law of One Every soul, living and discarnate, is connected to the level of the collective unconscious, deep within the higher self. We are all part of a great energy gestalt called God, and because we are part of God, we are God. It is the goal of the gestalt to move the energy forward, creating more energy. So, in living harmoniously, we each increase our vibrational rate and intensify the vibration of the entire gestalt. And when we are disharmonious, we decrease the vibration of the entire gestalt. Because we are one, everything you think, say, and do, and the motive, intent, and desire behind everything you think, say, and do affects every other soul. Number 10. The Law of Manifestation Everything manifest begins as a thought, an idea. Ideas and experiences create beliefs, which in turn create your reality. If you are unhappy with your current reality, you must change your beliefs and your behavior. Beliefs can be changed when you recognize those that are not working for you and begin programming what will create success and harmony in your life. The unlimited creative power of your mind, through dedication, awareness, and training, can be the wisdom to rise above your karma. Within physical laws, you can manifest any reality you desire to experience. In regard to changing your behavior, you must decide which disharmonious behaviors you want to eliminate. Then, be aware that you don't have to change how you feel about something to affect it, if you are willing to change what you are doing. Number 11. The Law of Conscious Detachment His earthly teachings are best summarized with one of his statements. It is your resistance to what is that causes your suffering. 
and by suffering he meant everything that doesn't work in your life. Relationship problems, loss of loved ones, loneliness, sickness, accidents, guilt, monetary hardship, unfulfilled desires, and so on. When you accept what is, you accept the unalterable realities in your life without resisting them. Some things are facts. They exist. And no matter how much you resist, there is nothing you are going to be able to do about them. Change what you can change, but have the wisdom to accept unalterable situations as they are without wasting mental or physical energy attempting to change what you cannot change. Out of this acceptance comes involved detachment, the ability to enjoy all the positive aspects of life, but to allow the negativity to flow through you without resistance and without affecting you. Number 12. The Law of Gratitude From the perspective of karma and the law of one, the more you give, the more you will receive. The more you assist others, the more you assist yourself. The power of this law also works in your day-to-day -day life. Number 13. The Law of Fellowship when two or more people of similar vibrations are gathered for a shared purpose, their combined energy directed to the attainment of that purpose is doubled, tripled, quadrupled, or more. This esoteric awareness has been used by covens, esoteric religions, healing groups, and recently worldwide meditations for peace. Number 14. The Law of Resistance That which you resist you draw to you, and you will perpetuate its influence upon your life. Resistance is fear, so it is to karmically resolve. The Law of Resistance assures that you let go of the fear by encountering it until you are forced to deal with it by learning conscious detachment. All right. Now, here are a couple of examples. Example number one. You were extremely resistant toward your mother-in-law, resulting in constant conflicts with her. Now, when you attain Master of Life Awareness and stop resisting her by consciously detaching from the negativity, the problem will be resolved. Most disharmonious situations are solved through a change in viewpoint. By changing your perspective, you can usually eliminate the effects of a problem. And if you no longer are affected by a problem, you no longer have a problem, although nothing about the problem situation may have changed. All right, now another aspect of the law of resistance states, that which you resist, you become, if not in this lifetime, in a future incarnation. So, as example number two, you have a strong resistance toward people of the Asian race. Your resistance is fear, and the quickest way to overcome fear is to directly experience that which you find so fearful. Thus, you will reincarnate as an Asian in a future lifetime. Number 15. The Law of Attraction Where your attention goes, your energy flows. You attract what you are and that what you concentrate upon. If you are negative, you draw in and experience negativity. If you are loving, you draw in and experience love. You can only attract to you those qualities you possess. So, if you want peace and harmony in your life, you must become peaceful and harmonious. Number 16. The Law of Reflection This law says that the traits you respond to in others you recognize in yourself, both positive and negative. It has four primary manifestations. Number one, that which you admire in others you recognize as existing within yourself. 
Number two, that which you resist in others and react to strongly in others is surely to be found within yourself. Number three, that you resist and react to in others is something which you are afraid exists within you. And number four, that which you resist in yourself you will dislike in others. In other words, you have chosen to incarnate upon the manifest plane to learn to rise above the effects of fear. Those fears will always be reflected in your reactions to others. Thus, your goals are very obvious once you recognize how to perceive them. As you let go of the fear, you automatically open to expressing more unconditional love. Number 17. The Law of Unconditional Love the expression of unconditional love will eventually result in harmony. Unconditional love is not romantic love. It's the acceptance of others as they are without judgment or expectations. It's the total acceptance of others without attempting to change the law of unconditional love says. If you go out of your way to express unconditional love, you automatically rise above fear. And, as you transcend your fears, you automatically open to the expression of unconditional love. Number 18. The Law of Magnetic Affinities By astrologically choosing the time and place of your birth, you determine the nature of the effects you will experience in your life. On the other side, before you were born, you made decisions about the lifetime you would be entering into. You chose your parents, other souls to interact with you, and the astrological configurations of your birth, which determine your character, personality, abilities, restrictions, and timing for strengths and weaknesses. If all of this seems too complicated to be real, be aware that you are only using 5 to 10 percent of the capacity of your brain. And the brain-mind researchers say the human brain has 200,000 times the capacity of the greatest computer ever built. Such calculations, as I've just described, would be no problem for such a computer. Number 19. The Law of Abundance you have within yourself everything required to make your earthly incarnation a paradise if you choose to accept that which is your natural birthright. We live in a universe of abundance, although the majority of those populating our planet appear to view it as a universe of scarcity. Number 20. The Law of Divine Order if you seek to understand the law of divine order, study the natural balance of it, for it works very much the same way. Everything is as it should be, although mankind is far from experiencing its potential of total harmony. There are no accidents. Your energy, translated into thoughts, words, emotions, and deeds, causes all your experiences. This assures that you always have the learning opportunities you require to resolve your karma. And, as with you, the collective thoughts, words, emotions, and deeds of mankind create the environment for us all. If enough souls focus their energy upon peace, we will have peace. If the majority of souls are filled with anger, we may all have to experience war. We are all one, and like the many subpersonalities within you, the dominant traits of mankind will emerge to resolve our group karma. At this moment, a born-again Christian evangelist preaches fear from a pulpit in West Virginia, while a yoga instructor directs a loving group meditation in Oregon. One is directing the energy of the gestalt into disharmony, the other into harmony. Hopefully, at least one can cancel out the other. If we can't attain harmony, maybe we can balance the disharmony. Certainly, as New Agers, we must not give up, individually 
or collectively. As always, fear is the problem and love is the answer. Number 21 is the Law of Attitude. Nothing in the universe can harm you but your own attitude. It is your attitude that moves you toward events and experiences, and it's your attitude that will worsen or lighten any event, catastrophe or tragedy. You and you alone choose the attitude with which you will respond. No two people would respond to the same situation in the same way. Every earthly incarnation includes traumatic experiences, and the better you understand the working of karma, the more likely you will be to put events into a spiritual perspective. Number 22. The Law of Threes. Two is generally recognized as positive and negative, and becomes a law only when combined with a neutralizing force. When three become a unit, neither of the original two are more powerful or larger, and each behaves for itself and the benefit of the whole. Examples are Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Conscious Mind, Subconscious Mind, and Superconscious Mind, Mother, Father, and Child. When a man and woman are combined with the neutralizing state of marriage, they become a three. Number 23, The Law of Association If two or more units have something in common, the commonality can be used to influence or control the other thing. The amount of control depends upon the degree of commonality. The more in common they both are, the more the influence. As an example, if you pray while holding a Bible, you will be more likely to experience a spiritual connectedness. The Bible and prayer share a commonality. As another example, proper diet and exercise share the mental commonality of perceived good health, which is more likely to manifest as the result of your assumption. Number 24. The Law of Commitment when you become clear on your intent, making a decision and obligating yourself to a task or a belief, everything begins to fall into place if your direction is in harmony with the universe as it relates to your purpose. Now, once you have pledged this direction, things begin to happen almost magically, as if you were a magnet drawing into your experience that which is needed for manifestation. The key to this ultimate power is to have no indecisiveness at all, and the greater your emotional desire, the more power you will give to those on the other side who can assist you, and the more rapidly the manifestation. Number 25. The Law of Dissonance. It says that you are going to experience mental discomfort when you hold two conflicting beliefs, or when your actions don't agree with your beliefs. As an example, you believe that smoking is bad for your health, yet you continue to smoke. You believe that extramarital affairs are morally wrong, and yet you continue to be involved with someone on the side. You believe that you should be a more patient mother, yet you continue to yell at your children. The law says that when your beliefs and actions are incompatible, you will attempt to reduce the resulting discomfort by changing either your actions or your beliefs. The smoker will become an ex-smoker, or he will deny or rationalize the health threat. The adulteress will either stop or rationalize her actions, maybe by saying, What my husband doesn't know won't hurt him, and besides... With my needs more fulfilled, I'm a better wife. The impatient mother changes her behavior or rationalizes her attitude by saying, It's better for me to yell and release the anger than to repress it. The law of dissonance is sometimes called the law of self-delusion. Number 26. 
Number 26, the law of experience. It says that new information entering your mind destroys previous information of a similar nature. Once a pathway of information has been established in your brain, that viewpoint will prevail unless new information comes in to destroy and replace it. As an example, while horseback riding, you fall off and hurt yourself. Now, if that's the end of your experience with horses, your experience has been programmed negatively. That's why instructors always urge new riders to climb back aboard immediately after falling off. You need fresh, new input to erase the trauma of the fall. The law is an innate, organic process that does not require your conscious attention or active participation. It suggests that the basic processes of the brain are in an endless state of growth and reorganization. Now, the law of experience can be used effectively in altered state of consciousness programming because your subconscious cannot tell the difference between fantasized experience and a real experience. So, as an example, if you always feel extreme anxiety in crowds, in an altered state you could vividly imagine yourself perfectly relaxed in a crowd of people. Your mind will accept this as a reality and invoke the law of experience. After a few days, weeks, or months of this programming, your mind will have totally experienced being calm in crowds, and it will carry over into your personal reality. Number 27. The Law of Fearful Confrontation This law says that if you fear doing something, and yet have the courage to do it anyway, you will soon do a mental flip-flop, and may even become addicted to doing it. As an example, if you fear skydiving, but force yourself to do it, the experience generates the internal release of beta endorphins. These internally manufactured opiates chemically resemble opium and are quite addicting. The more you skydive, the more you will want to skydive, or ski straight down mountains or gamble, or whatever it was that you originally feared and that still causes you this internal rush. Number 28. The Law of group consciousness. Every one of us is part of a great energy gestalt and connected on the level of the collective unconscious. Each individual aspect of the gestalt has its own electrical system, its own vibrational frequency, and interreacts with all other aspects. Thus, we are all electrically connected to one another and to a central point. On a higher self or psychic level, it is possible for anyone to tune in to anyone else and to draw upon the awareness of the entire gestalt. Like the concept of the hundredth monkey, mankind takes advancing steps when group consciousness reaches a critical mass and new awareness is accepted by the whole. Number 29. The Law of Personal Return Although this law is really just another way to view karma, some people prefer it. It says if you think negatively of someone or send hateful thoughts to them, the thoughts may harm the person, but in due course they will return to the sender as sent. The same is true of disharmonious deeds. But the good news is, the law of personal return also works in reverse, and positive thoughts, words, and deeds will be returned to the sender. Number 30. The Law of Activity It says that action is the result of thought and part of a triad. Every thought produces an alchemical process in your consciousness and is the manifestation of motive, intent, or desire. This union of two is necessary for action and will ordain the karmic implications. Number 31. The Law of Denial 
It says when you refuse to deal with a highly emotional issue or refuse to take responsibility for an unpleasant situation, you avoid living up to your potential. Such things can be put off for lifetimes, but the effect will be experienced mentally, physically, or as a lifestyle manifestation until you correctly balance the situation. Number 32. The Law of New Beginnings It says that for each of us in our time there are major life turning points. There is a break in the energy wave patterns and a complete change will result. Everything is affected by this change in flux, some things to a lesser degree than others. Examples would be 1. A traumatic situation or tragedy such as the death of a loved one. 2. A religious conversion. 3. A point in therapy when something clicks and from that time on the patient begins to get well. And 4. A mother giving birth to a baby. Number 33. The Law of Compensation. It says that you and you alone are responsible for everything that happens to you. All is the result of your past thoughts, words, and deeds, which have formed your present attitude. Your attitude towards life and life experiences is returned to you in the form of rewards or problems, as love and joy, or as confusion, trouble, and heartbreaking experience. These karmic rewards or punishments can be delivered immediately, at a later date in your present life, or in a future incarnation. Number 34. The Law of Psychometric Influence It says that two things, animate or inanimate, once in contact with each other, will continue to act upon each other, even at a distance long after the actual contact has been severed. Matter coming into contact with other matter absorbs and influences as a result of the contact. There is a psychometric blending of the etheric emanations. Thus, the person wearing a piece of inherited jewelry will be influenced by the psychometric emanations of the original owner. The more empathic the person is, the more likely she will be to be influenced by the state of mind of the original owner. As another example, when the contact takes place between two people, the intensity of the contact will dictate the degree and duration of the influence. So, a sexual union would result in a lengthy mental connection of the two people, even if they did not see each other again. Neither might recognize this consciously, but on an unconscious level, contact and influence continues. Number 35. The Law of Totality it says that each part of a totality has its own characteristics and also takes on the characteristics of the totality as a sum of its parts. Each part thus has two functions, to retain its own characteristics and to function as part of the totality. When separated, each part remains connected to the totality, and because it retains the characteristics of the totality, it can perform as the totality. Now you may not realize this yet, but since you are part of God, you contain the potential to perform as God. This law is often expressed as the law of one. Number 36. The Law of Dominant Desire it says that a stronger emotion will always dominate a weaker one. Every idea you perceive is the beginning of a manifestation, although all ideas are not expressed in reality. It doesn't matter which idea you consciously favor, or even know to be desirable. The stronger emotion will nullify the weaker ones, and the strongest emotion will begin to permeate all aspects of your activities. As an example, if you are emotionally focused upon the sexual desirability of a particular person, 
you may begin to create circumstances in many life areas which will increase the likelihood of an eventual sexual union. Number 37. The Law of Duality. It says the universe and all energy functions as a yin-yang balance, resulting in a tension between opposites. Yin is negative, yang is positive. And we all contain these dual aspects expressed as love and hate, harmony and chaos, good and evil. Actually, this tension is necessary for structure to exist. And human beings are energy structures. Now, don't be mistaken and think in terms of negative being bad. An automobile battery is a good analogy. One plate is charged positive, the next negative, the next positive, and so on. It's the interaction between the plates that generates the energy, but the negative plate is not better than the positive plate. Now, in relating this to your life, you must realize that without tension you don't exist. Thus, there is a need for yin balance in your life. Most people express their yin energy in undesirable ways, such as self-denial, excess hard work, gambling, dangerous activities, such as driving too fast, or in arguing or fighting. Illness is an expression of yin energy, and war is the ultimate expression of mass yin energy. But your yin energy can be expressed in a different way, as positive challenge, and this is best explained in the next law. Number 38, the law of self-destruction. It says, as a natural expression of the law of duality, that which is totally successful tends to destroy itself. Now, you know this subconsciously. So there is no way you dare allow your relationships or career or spirituality to become totally successful. You realize if you reach that pinnacle, you greatly increase the potential for self-destruction. Now here are some examples. 1. History proves that any country that has ever reached a peak has fragmented and collapsed all on its own when it was unopposed. Number 2. The second example is a couple that struggles through many forms of adversity, getting the husband through college, sickness and a badly timed pregnancy, financial problems and family trouble. But eventually they arrive at a point going well. It's then that they get a divorce. Example number three is the spiritual seeker who is making profound progress only to backslide and behave very negatively. The recent fall of the most successful cult leaders and television evangelists make this case. Example 4 is a successful business executive who makes it to the top of his profession, then has a midlife identity crisis or a nervous breakdown, and destroys it all. Example 5 is the man who inherits wealth and destroys himself through dissipation. Example 6 is the honest man who becomes a powerful politician and becomes very corrupt. Now, in each of the six examples, once total success was obtained, there was no more challenge, and destruction followed. Subconsciously, in each case, they desired to experience the challenge again. Unless you challenge yourself, you will stagnate. Now, remember, you are energy. And stagnation is self-destruction, for energy cannot stand still. It must, by its very nature, move forward or backwards. So, instead of holding back, attain total success, but not complacency. Always give yourself great new challenges. If you let the challenge go too far, self-destruction is the result. If you don't incorporate challenge in your life, self-destruction is the result. If you keep challenge in balance, you succeed in maintaining your position 
and retaining your success. The secret is to consciously direct challenge in a way that minimizes jeopardy while fulfilling the yin-yang need of balance. This will usually be accomplished by wise risking. Number 39. The Law of Environmental Manifestation It says that everything that surrounds you is an extension of you. Your mate, your home, your furnishings, your car, your pets, your yard, your office, and your career are a physical expression of your attitudes and belief system. Your environment is a reality picture of your core beliefs and expresses your self-image and cultural overview. Number 40. The Law of Restriction It says that man cannot create anything higher than his own level of understanding. Thus, society can never get any better than the level of mankind as a whole. Our systems for social change usually only add new burdens to already ineffective systems. Time has proven that this approach to a new society doesn't work. And our mistake is in trying to right the wrongs of the world from the outside in. This is working on the effect instead of the cause, and is doomed to failure. Instead, we must work from the inside out. Every one of us on this planet can incorporate the power of harmonious thinking, which is the only long-term solution to poverty and limitation. To heal the world, we must each first heal ourselves. Number 41. The Law of Self-Worth It says that you can only attract to you that which you feel worthy of. Your self-esteem is critical to your happiness and success. The truth is, you are not what you have, and you are not what you do. Beneath your fear programming, you are perfect, an enlightened soul fully self-actualized and living example of unconditional love. It is only lifetimes of fear programming that are keeping you from acknowledging who you really are. The more you can let go of the fears, the higher your self-esteem, and the more options you will have, and the more risks you can take. The better you like yourself, the better others will like you, and the more worthy you will feel. Number 42. The Law of Growth it says that there is no growth without discontent. Deep within your center, at the level of higher self, you know what is best for you, and it will always be to strive for more awareness. Never allow yourself to reach a level of self-satisfaction where there is no new challenge. For most of us, there will be no growth without agitation or discontent. So the idea is to carefully study your dissatisfactions, for they will tell you what you are about to leave behind and possibly point to new future directions. Make sure the future is one of happiness and success. Number 43. The Law of Self-Truth It says that truth is what works for you. If you believe something to be, it becomes truth for you. The idea is to be very careful about what you accept to be, for it will influence all aspects of your life and your future. Number 44. The Law of Summarized Experience It says that you are the sum total of all that has ever happened to you in this life you are now living, and in all of your past, everything from your health to your relationships, your sexual experiences, your developed abilities, your career standing, and everything else can be used as a barometer to show who you are and to tell if your conscious and subconscious 
are functioning in harmony. Number 45. The Law of Belief. It says you can have anything you want if you can give up the belief that you can't have it, as long as what you want doesn't conflict with someone else's belief. As an example, if you desire a fulfilling, growth-oriented, one-to-one -one relationship, but demand it to be with a particular person, you are not operating in harmony with the universe. As another example, in the area of accomplishment, you must leave the education necessary to create what you want. So, this is the area on which to focus your desirous energy. Number 46. The Law of Dharmic Direction It says that you have within you a guiding principle, which is your duty to yourself and society. Karma has directed your past life and present life experiences, always urging you to forge ahead into activities and learning experiences to form the character required to fulfill your destiny. Now, of course, you always have the free will not to fulfill your dharma. But the secret is to listen to your inner direction, which will direct you to fulfill your dharma and resolve your karma. Your dharmic direction is natural for you and probably falls within one of seven directions. One is workforce, and this path includes a majority of general occupations, including homemakers. Two is military and includes soldiers in all forms of police and militia. Number three is service and includes most religious workers, those in medical, social services and welfare, and many practicing metaphysicians. Number four is creativity and includes artists, writers, poets, musicians, actors and entertainers. Number five is science and includes medical researchers, scientists, space technologists, and physicists. Number six is philosophy, and includes all who present theories about why man does what he does. Number seven is government, and includes political leaders from the president on down through all areas of elected office. Number 47 the law of purifying action. It says that by living the three pillars of Dharma, you will spiritually evolve. The first pillar is generosity, meaning non-greed, letting go. The karmic results of generosity are abundance and deep harmonious relationships with others. The second pillar is moral restraint. This includes five basic precepts not killing, not stealing, not committing sexual misconduct, not using wrong speech, not taking intoxicants which could cloud the mind and make it dull. Now, as an explanation, sexual misconduct means refraining from actions of sensuality which cause pain and harm to others or turbulence or disturbance in ourselves. Refraining from wrong speech means not only telling the truth, but avoiding a lot of useless and frivolous talk and gossip. Speech should be gentle, creating harmony and unity between people. All right, now the third pillar of Dharma is meditation, and it covers two areas. The first is concentration, the ability of the mind to stay steady on an object without wavering. Second is the cultivation of insight, which means to see clearly the process of things and the nature of Dharma. Number 48. The Law of Karmic Excess. It says that karma incurred in one incarnation could be so overwhelmingly harmonious or disharmonious that to have it all return in one lifetime would put you out of balance. Therefore, it is dispersed or worked out in more than one incarnation. Number 49. The Law of Release It advises you to let go of anything that is no longer useful and purposeful, without regrets 
and without resentment. This includes such things as books, philosophy, clothing, a belief, your lifestyle, even a club membership, and the list goes on and on. The pleasure should be in the moment of the experience, and when it's no longer useful, by letting go you free yourself to start another learning experience without being bound by the old. Number 50. The Law of Ritual It says that any act performed repeatedly with specific intent becomes a rite. Each time the ritual is repeated, its power is enhanced in three ways. First, by focusing on the intent, the performer intensifies the power of his mind to control reality. Second, the performer gives permission to his guides and those on the other side to assist him in the desired manifestation. And third, each performance of the rite draws upon the energy of all who have used the rite throughout all time. As an example, in using the pentacle rite of protection, the performer draws upon the energy of people over the centuries who have used this rite to ward off negativity. Thus the power is increased many fold. All right. That concludes a quick look at the fifty primary universal laws. I hope you were served by the wisdom of this esoteric awareness.